Dreamscape presents The Bondage Breaker Overcoming Negative Thoughts, Irrational Feelings, Habitual Sins by Neil T. Anderson Narrated by Sean Compton A Note from Neil When I was a pastor, I taught God's Word to the best of my ability, but I didn't see much substantive change in the lives of the faithful people who attended the church regularly. Many had problems I didn't have adequate answers for. I was sharing information, but not seeing the transformation that I believed was possible. In 1982, I left the pastorate to teach at Talbot School of Theology. At the seminary, I offered a Master's of Theology elective on spiritual warfare. In truth, I was searching for answers myself. I was looking for a holistic, Christ-centered, biblically-based answer that was true for all people, irrespective of culture and time. This left-brained ex-aerospace engineer went through a lot of paradigm shifts during those ten years at Talbot. The class I started nearly doubled in size every year, and I began to see the lives of my students change as they discovered who they were in Christ and learned how to resolve their personal and spiritual conflicts. At the same time, God was directing a lot of hurting people to me with all kinds of problems, and I slowly learned how Christ really is the answer and how the truth really does set us free. I loved teaching at Talbot, but I knew that God was directing me to take this message to the world. So in 1989, I founded Freedom in Christ Ministries, which now has offices, staff, and representatives all over the world. In all my years of ministry, I have never gone where I haven't been invited. Half the churches that have invited me were evangelical, and the other half have been Pentecostal or charismatic. I have never attempted to raise money for the ministry, and we don't charge a fee for helping people. Our staff raise their own support. We don't advertise and don't spend any money marketing our product. I share my story in Rough Road to Freedom, Monarch. A lot has happened since the first edition of this book. I have learned so much from interacting with various denominational leaders around the world. I see myself as a pastor-teacher, and I have written books on reconciliation, prayer, marriage, parenting, anger, fear, anxiety, depression, chemical addiction, and sexual addiction. I don't believe I have any special anointing or giftedness. I believe God has given me the gift of exhortation, but that's it. I believe it is the work of a pastor-teacher to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. All our staff are liberated children of God, and none are better than any others. Any mature Christian can do what we do to help others if they are equipped, and that is why our ministry exists. Our purpose is to glorify God by equipping the church worldwide, enabling churches to establish their people, marriages, and ministries alive and free in Christ through genuine repentance and faith in God. Our U.S. office offers online training, www.ficm.org. Our international director, Steve Goss, is based in Reading, England, www.ficminternational.org. I have since retired, and for the last six years I have cared for Joanne, my wife of 52 years who was promoted to glory on October 2, 2018. I have experienced the peace of God during this time in a rather remarkable way, which I wrote about in The Power of Presence, Monarch. The core message of the bondage breaker hasn't changed, and I'm thankful that Harvest House asked me to do this new edition. I'm a better writer now, and I have more insight about this fallen world and its inhabitants than I did 30 years ago. I pray that you will listen to this book carefully and take the opportunity to go through the steps to freedom in Christ. You have nothing to lose and much to gain. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Neil T. Anderson Introduction Free at Last Years ago I was speaking in a Southern California church on the subject of the New Age movement. My text was 1 Timothy 4.1. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, 
Some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. New International Version After my message, I was surrounded at the front of the sanctuary by a mob of people. Sitting halfway back in the auditorium was a 22-year-old woman who had been weeping uncontrollably since the service ended. Several people had tried to comfort her, but she wouldn't allow anyone to get near her. Finally, a church staff member cut through the crowd around me and said, I'm sorry, folks, but we need Dr. Anderson back here right away. As I approached the young woman, I could hear her sobbing. He understands, he understands. We were able to get her out of the sanctuary and into a private office. After she calmed down, I scheduled an appointment to meet with her the next week. When Nancy arrived for her appointment, her face was covered with open wounds. I've been scratching myself like this ever since last week, and I can't control it, she admitted sheepishly. Nancy described her horrible childhood, which included an abusive father and a grandmother who identified herself as a black witch. When I was three years old, I received my guardians, spirit guides, she continued. They were my companions, telling me how to live and what to say. I never questioned whether having spirit guides was anything but normal until my mother took me to Sunday school. Then I began to suspect that my spirit guides might not be good for me. When I asked my parents about it, my father beat me. I never asked again. In order to cope with the increasing torment that her spirit guides brought to her life, Nancy resorted to rigid personal discipline. In her high school years, she decided to believe in God. But instead of leaving, her guardians continued to harass her. After high school, Nancy turned to the epitome of discipline, the Marines. Determined to become the toughest of the lady leathernecks, she won awards for her discipline but her spiritual torment kept pushing her mind and emotions to the edge. She refused to tell anyone about her mental battles, for fear that she would be labeled insane. Finally, the pressure overcame her, and she snapped. Nancy quietly accepted a medical discharge and retreated to a lonely existence of inner turmoil and pain. This was Nancy's condition when she came to church that day and heard me talk about deceiving spirits. Finally, someone understands me, Nancy concluded tearfully. Would you like to get rid of your spirit guides? I asked. There was a long pause. Will they really leave, or will I go home and be thrashed by them again? You will be free, I assured her. Two hours later, Nancy was free, and was hugging us with an openness she had never known before. Now I can have people over to my house, she exclaimed joyfully. The Reality of the Dark Side There was a time when I thought Nancy's experience was an unusual exception to the norm. Although the degree of her problem was somewhat exceptional, I have come to realize that the Apostle Paul had in mind every believer when he wrote, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6.12 After more than 45 years of ministry as a pastor, seminary professor, and conference speaker, I have ministered to thousands of Christians all over the world who are being deceived and living defeated lives. This is a real tragedy, because their Heavenly Father desires for them to live a free and productive life in Christ. My own journey into this realm of ministry did not come by choice, I was a left-brained aerospace engineer before God called me into ministry. Even as a Christian layman, I wasn't curious about demonic activity or the occult. The lure of esoteric knowledge and occultic power never appealed to me. I never played with a Ouija board, tarot cards, a magic eight ball, or had my palms read or fortune told. And I don't know what my astrological sign is to this day. On the other hand, I have never doubted what the Bible says about the spiritual world, even when it seemed to conflict with my Western world view. Initially, I understood pastoral ministry as the application of sanctified common sense. I would try to speak the truth in love and encourage Christians to live accordingly by faith. It didn't take me long to realize that giving good advice wasn't enough for those in bondage and struggling with anger, fear, anxiety, and depression. 
These dear people had no mental peace, and I slowly began to understand the battle that was going on in their minds. I kept going back again and again to Scripture, looking for the truth that would set them free. In the process, I discovered who I was in Christ, how to resolve personal and spiritual conflicts, and then I started to see God set His children free and heal their wounds. God wants you free and growing in Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote that we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4, 15 and 13 If God has given us everything we need to mature in Christ, 2 Peter 1, 3, then why aren't more Christians growing in Christ? Some are no more like Him now than they were twenty years ago. Paul said, The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 1 Timothy 1.5 We should be able to say every year, I am more loving, patient, and kind, and experiencing more joy, peace, and self-control than I was last year. If we can't say that, then we are not growing. Part of the reason for this carnality is given in 1 Corinthians 3, 2-3. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? According to Paul, some Christians are not even able to receive good biblical instruction because of unresolved personal and spiritual conflicts in their lives. What is needed is some way to resolve these personal and spiritual conflicts through genuine repentance and faith in God. That is the purpose of this book. My first book, Victory Over the Darkness, Bethany House Publishers, focuses on the believer's life in Christ and walk by faith. The book deals with the foundational issues of our identity in Christ and outlines practical steps on how to live by faith, walk according to the Spirit, renew our mind, manage our emotions, and resolve the emotional traumas of our past through faith and forgiveness. Before we received Christ, we were slaves to sin. Now, because of Christ's work on the cross, sin's power over us has been broken. Satan has no right of ownership or authority over us. He is a defeated foe, but he is committed to keeping us from realizing that. The father of lies can block your effectiveness as a Christian if he can deceive you into believing that you are nothing but a product of your past, subject to sin, prone to failure, and controlled by your habits. Paul said, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Galatians 5.1 You are free in Christ, but you will be defeated if the devil can deceive you into believing you are nothing more than a sin-sick product of your past. Nor can Satan do anything about your position in Christ. But if he can deceive you into believing that what Scripture says isn't true, you will live as though it isn't. People are in bondage to the lies they believe. That is why Jesus said, You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. John 8, 32 I don't believe in instant maturity. It will take us the rest of our lives to renew our minds and become like Christ, but it doesn't take long to help people resolve their personal and spiritual conflicts and find their freedom in Christ. Being alive and free in Christ is part of a positional sanctification, which is the basis for progressive sanctification. In other words, we are not trying to become children of God. We are children of God who are becoming like Christ. Once people are established alive and free in Christ through genuine repentance and faith in God, watch them grow. They have a new thirst for the Word of God, and they know who they are in Christ because the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Romans 8.16 In this book, I have attempted to clarify the nature of spiritual conflicts and outline how they can be resolved in Christ. Part 1 explains your position, protection, and authority in Christ. Part 2 
warns of your vulnerability to temptation, accusation, and deception.